that. They shaped your life, the Spice Girls, didn't they? Were you hanging literally from the side of a rock? Yeah, man, rock climbing. Oh. He lived in a van by a river. I live as strong as maybe a strong characterization. I momentarily stayed in a van uh, near rivers. Hello. It's great to be with all of you for Worth the Journey, a Worthington Schools podcast. My name is Angie Adrian, and I get to serve Worthington Schools as the Assistant Superintendent of Academics. And I'm Jeff Maddox. I am the Director of Human Resources for the Worthington Schools. Together, we are your hosts for this podcast and appreciate you taking the time to hear the stories of those that we get to work alongside of in Worthington Schools. We are a district of about 11,000 students and 1,400 staff. In Worthington, we take pride in building strong relationships with others, which really impacts our culture. That culture makes us understand each other better. And if we understand each other, it's a whole lot more fun to work together. So true. It takes intentional effort to really build these relationships. And one way that we do that is through storytelling. When we started this podcast, I did a little bit of research on storytelling. And what I learned was that storytelling triggers the brain's responses that affect both our mental and our physical makeups. This Worth the Journey is a podcast with a purpose of just that to share the stories of the awesome humans that we get to work alongside of each and every day in Worthington Schools. And before we introduce our guests, we're going to talk yeah. with a high school English teacher today. Pretty and intimidating. He, and he, very intimidating. He's going to ask us to diagram sentences. What was your favorite book you read in high school that was a mm. required book to read? Do you remember? One of the toughest books or readings for me in high school was the Canterbury Tales. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Absolutely. Um, my favorite, I was an Ernest Hemingway guy. Some people find him very simplistic. Maybe that's why I gravitate towards him. I really, and to this day, I own a copy of Old Man in the Sea because I love that book. Al Bindman, shout out to Al Bindman. He was my 10th grade English teacher. We did Julius Caesar. Okay. What was, about Romeo really and Juliet? Good. Yes, we did it. And yeah. it was one that I did not gravitate towards oh, you. Oh, really? Did you like Romeo I and Juliet? I liked Romeo. Yeah, absolutely. With us today, we have Todd Secuti. Todd Secuti is an English teacher at Worthington Kilbourne High School. Welcome, Todd. Hey, it's thanks good for coming you. in today, thanks Todd. For me. It's, it's good to so see fun. you. Give us your background. I wasn't a super great student. My mom is a teacher. She and I talked about learning and teaching and being a student a lot when I was really young. And I think that I probably, in a very unjustified way, was pretty critical of my high school experience when I was a student. I think that part of why I wanted to be a teacher was because I certainly had great teachers, but I looked at a lot of my experiences and said, I think there's a way that would work better for me. I think I saw an opportunity to do something that I could change some people's experiences for the for the better and just be the teacher that I always wanted. I was a baseball umpire from the time I was 13 years old until that's the end of high That's not an easy gig. No, it, it really wasn't. You mean you don't make everyone happy when no. you're a baseball umpire? You no. make almost no one <laughs> happy ever. I would be so happy to umpire baseball games all day long, whatever age, age eight, age 15, didn't care. I was good at it. I liked it. But what the one thing you don't ever want to do is get between a softball dad and their daughter. One of the more intense experiences of my life to have to do, like someone was like, hey, I need you to do softball games for like half of this summer. I was like, okay, can't be that different. Never again. Yeah. It, 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 that was one an experience. Done. I was one of those softball daughters. And my dad liked to use the phrase zebra. Yeah. To an umpire. Right. So did that. Uh, worked in restaurants the day I, like, as soon as I was 16, I started working in restaurants. I just loved working um, and making my own money, being able to spend it on whatever I wanted. As soon as I graduated high school, I, I moved out. Uh, I knew that college wasn't in the um, immediate plan, but I had enough faith in my own willpower uh, to know that when I was ready to go to college, I would. Because I knew that academics was something that was really important to me. I really liked learning. I was just, I wasn't focused. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. Um, I really think, try to thank myself often for not just doing the thing that everyone said, go do this. Disclaimer that by saying, I don't think it's the move for everyone. It's not something I would suggest to my students. I would certainly encourage them to consider uh, maybe taking a year off if you want to 
just save some money, think about your college plan. I would never look at a student and be like, hey, take four years off before you go back <laughs> to college. I had other interests. I, I was um, into rock climbing. I was into music, uh, playing music. I played in bands and all that stuff. And so the restaurant business made it really easy for me to make a chunk of change quick and then take three weeks off if I wanted to go. If we had a tour for music, uh, toured a lot uh, with bands. Um, or if I wanted to go live in my van down at the Red River Gorge and rock climb for a few weeks, I was taking both those things pretty seriously. Had a lot of really fun, um, instructive times, uh, learning how to just interpersonal relationships as well as professional relationships um, at a young age. And so I was really thankful for that. Eventually, it's like I looked around and sort of like there's no money in either of those things. I mean, rock climbing and rock and roll. It, it's just not a, a thing that you make money on. So started going to Columbus State, knew I wanted to be a teacher, but never thought to go talk to a counselor about how I like get the right credits for that and all that stuff. But eventually transferred from from Columbus State to Capitol, where I just had a ball. It was great. I was still working. I was doing coffee shop barista stuff. Really, really proud to have put myself through school. Really proud to have worked my butt off. Yeah. Interviewed, um, with with Worthington, I remember doing like a, a I don't know what you call them, like those heater interviews. Screener. Where, yeah, the screeners um, with you. And then Eric and I, I mean, I remember where I was the moment that Eric Thomas called and offered me the job. Tell I was, us about that. Oh, well, I was yeah. I was working. I was working at a, a coffee shop called Luck Bros in Grandview and got a call from a number I didn't know, ran to the back of the shop where nobody could see me, took it. And yeah, it was just it's hard to keep working for the day, but it, it was a fun, exciting moment. And yeah, it's just really vivid to me because I was, that's kind of the culmination of like my dreams. I always wanted to be a teacher. I have um, many interviews and that I will always remember. Um, Todd's was one of those interviews. Oh. Um, I can tell you exactly where we were and where we sat and kind of like how he just laid out how he got himself into education. He laid that out and pulled you into his story, which was cool. When you were a high school student and you thought, I want to go into education, there's things that I can do differently. What are some of those best practices that you use now in the classroom that that you feel like is something you needed when you were in school? One of the things I tell all of my classes, really before the year gets going, each one of you is a person before you're a student. And that's something that I was never told as a student. We know how much um, things that happen outside of the classroom um, in these students' real lives affect how they perform in the classroom, both in the short term and the long term. No one who ever really told me what I meant to them as a student. And wow. So I think that that's, that's really, that's a philosophy that I think umbrellas a lot of my other sort of smaller philosophies in the classroom. The series that we're doing right now um, is really trying to get in the hearts and minds of our new teachers. And so this is six years for you. Mm -hmm. You're still newish, mm -hmm. but you've made a, a huge impact on Worthington Kilbourne High School and the students who are in it um, as an English teacher. What's a great story of reflection or story of being a difference maker that you can remember? And certainly we don't need to know students' names, sure, but, sure. but have you impacted those students? You know, in the moment, it's hard to think of like the one specific one. I'm seeing so many faces. A thing that's happened a couple of times, I think, is demonstrative. I've been teaching Honors English 1 every year I've been at Kilbourne. Oh, gosh, I'm like tearing up thinking about it. There are students who open up to me about stuff that's going on at home, deaths in the family, divorces. The thing that happened that has happened to me a couple of times that I'm really proud of is that it'll be a student's senior year, right, after I've had him as a freshman. And I haven't had many opportunities. I'm only six years in, right? It's only couple years of opportunities for this, but when a student will come to me like at graduation, literally at graduation and say, hey, you remember that day when, and fill in the blank there. But as teachers, we're dealing with 130 students every day, give or take. And, it, and sometimes the moments that mean the most to a student are, I mean, not that they barely register with us as teachers, but that they get thrown into a crowded basket of other moments too. When I have a student who, who's able to say, hey, you remember that one day, freshman year, when I came into your classroom after six period, when you had your off period and I had my off period and we talked about this thing, right? And you said this to me. 
Um, I just want to say thank you for that. It's never academic, never academic. Isn't that fascinating? We have amazing educators in Worthington that grow students, but we know that about our profession, and that is when students look backwards, they define their experience based on how they felt, mm -hmm. not based on what they learned. Now, yeah. don't ever forget, your job is to grow kids. But when they define that experience, mm -hmm. it's how they felt. Yeah. And that's what you just said. That's a, that's really cool. But take us back to your first year and talk to us about that experience. Year one, every moment felt like life or death. Every moment. That's because I didn't really know how to put up boundaries. The thing I like most about teaching is that it's an infinite job. There's no such thing as perfection. And we're always thinking and working. A good teacher is uh, never stops working. But a good teacher will also knows how to put up the boundaries that allow you to actually function in life. That first year of teaching, show up two hours early to school to like make sure the plans were good and like tweak them. Not that I knew how to do that, really. <laughs> Every moment of the day, just be frantic. After school, I would go home and I would vociferate over that and repeat. Like, maybe you need that year of doing that. I don't think there's a way to teach somebody how to have these kinds of boundaries that a third, fourth, fifth year teacher has learned how to construct for themselves. But the job is infinite. So for a first year teacher, I, I think it's probably pretty common. I haven't talked to that many first year teachers on a level like this. When you have a job where you could work 24 seven, theoretically, it's really, really hard to put it down when you're just trying to prove yourself and to do the right thing for the students. Who are the people in your life that first year you leaned on? Oh my God. And how did you lean on them? First and foremost, my wife, who had gotten me through a really, really pretty hectic student teaching experience too. And by the time I was trying to get through my first year, she sort of knew how to talk to me about calming down, you've been through this before, all that stuff, day by day. I was really lucky to have Amy Freed as my mentor. I'm not, I'm not really into the type A, type B thing. I understand that there's a lot of gray area there, but I, I'm certainly more type B if we're going to categorize it. And Amy Freed is as type A as it gets. And I really needed that. Otherwise, I would have been just sandboxing all day when sometimes you just need to make the call and say, okay, I'm doing this. She was there to kind of get my brain into planning, thinking one week out, two week out, like short arcs, long arcs types of stuff. You know, it's kind of ironic about that, Todd, is you can have a type A, type B and understand that there's everything in between, but you need each other, right? Yeah. Where Amy Freed helped you, I'm sure that your type of thinking helped Amy become a better teacher too. So mentor, mentee, that partnership of the two of you really certainly makes a difference for both of you. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we were teaching the same course. Yeah. Like we were teaching English 2 together. While the mentorship stuff was there, while we were doing the mentor stuff, it was all actually applicable. We were able to kind of mix the mentorship with the planning. And that was really helpful. And, and you saying that reminds me of how, just how much I think we did help each other. I'm thinking of guys like Jeff Vincent, who just retired. Some of the really veteran teachers who a first year teacher will show up and just, I mean, you wouldn't even make eye contact with these guys in the hallway. <laughs> Because you're a shrimp, right? <laughs> but so many uh, of the really veteran teachers at, at Kilbourne proactively found me, told me like, hey, everything you're feeling right now is normal. And, and that, that's the thing that I, that I wish all first year teachers could realize is that inexplicably crazy emotions you're feeling are so normal. 13 years ago, I was a brand new principal in that building. Mm -hmm. um, and the teachers did the same thing for me, right? Just kind of welcomed me in and, and helped me understand, you know, all aspects of the building, the traditions of the building and, and everything else. So you're lucky to have started there. That's for sure. Yeah. And if anyone at Kilbourne, who helped me during my first <laughs> right. year, is listening didn't <laughs> and didn't hear their name specifically, um, right. I, I think about all of you all the time. And uh, I couldn't be more thankful to work with a group of people like you. Will you say again to new teachers that what they're feeling is normal? Yeah. Because what you just said there is what we kind of hope that we would get out of this series. And that is, it's going to be okay. You are going to have emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. And you had those yourself. New teachers. It's hard for you to even talk about what you're feeling right now because it, it's it's a feeling that no other experience could replicate. And it's totally normal. And that's okay. Get nice. through it. Now that I'm in year six, I mean, I'm not sage wisdom or anything. I, I would never presume that. But the thing that I now tell all new teachers who I get to interact with is, hey, make it to year three. Just get there. Get to year three. And then year four will happen. And then you're five. And it's fun now. Right. Like it's fun now. Right. 
I, I, and uh, teaching was fun my first year too. Fun in the sense that every now and then I did something right, you know, like. <laughs> and now you better do it all yeah, right because right. you have right. no excuses now, right, Todd. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> every okay. lesson is perfect. That's right. Todd, I was um, over at Worthington Kilbourne High School a couple of days ago and um, spent some time talking with Eric Thomas, your principal. And um, on his whiteboard in his office was just kind of this list of names on one side and then another long list of names on the other side. And I was like, Eric, what's, you know, what are you working on? Like, he's like, Angie, that's a list of new staff from last year and a list of new staff for this year. Um, talk to us a little bit about the culture at Worthington Kilbourne High School and what you believe some of those new staff have provided for Worthington Kilbourne. In my experience at Kilbourne, it's team effort, always. I've never met a person at Kilbourne who, who wasn't ready to stop what they're doing to help me out. So with the new teachers, it, it's really exciting. I mean, what an opportunity for the building. To, to continue that culture, right? We have so many veteran teachers who really understand that their classroom works better when every classroom works better. No one's an island there. If these new teachers are successful in the classroom, happy in the classroom, happy out of the classroom, happy with sort of the school sanctioned things that we're doing, happy with the policies that we're putting in place, happy with the way that the staff leadership groups are advocating for the staff, we understand that if we pass all that on to those new teachers, then they're a wolf for life. One of the things I appreciated the most when, when we interviewed new teachers um, was that we had current veteran staff a part of that interview. So when you have veteran staff a part of those team interviews, when that new staff is onboarded, there's relationships built during the interview process. And so that allows for that culture to be built um, from day one. From the moment you meet that new teacher, you're, you're building a relationship. Absolutely. And I mean, that, that goes for when you, you meet any person ever. In that context, you're building a relationship with that teacher, something that you say or do in that interview, that's going to stick with them. I, I remember every second of my interview. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Thankfully, that interview was kind and, and forgiving and graceful and all that. And I remember that. And it, and it endears me to Kilbourne. Our hope is that the, those interview, that interview process is almost like a conversation, a little bit like what we're doing today, right? Yeah. Because we want to get to know every candidate, not just their abilities in the classroom with the content that they might be teaching, but also who are they? That overall process that we have here in Worthington Schools um, really helps us hire some of the best. Can I give some interviewing tips yeah. real quick? Yeah, interviewing yeah. tips. I, I Let's mean, do and it. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily think that our teachers need it because they're already hired here and they shouldn't be interviewing anywhere else ever again. <laughs> I get that. When I talked to Yo Smith, who was department head, she said that what kind of put me over in that interview was the, was the fact that I would stop and actually think about answers. Her telling me that and being open with me about that has really influenced me to keep doing that, to keep thinking, right? I, you don't need an immediate answer. Just stop and think. It's impressive when someone stops and thinks because that, that says so much about who they are. They're being like, reflective and they care about the answer they're going to give. Right? right. And in the classroom, no one expects you to have an immediate answer to a surprise. Stop and think and teach those kids to stop and think too. So, That's great advice. Todd, you're a naturally reflective person. But as you know, nerves take over too. How do you get on top of those nerves? That's tough, Jeff. It's it, tough. Because there are going to be nerves there. Because I, I think I could give a, a lot of, a variety of answers to how do you get over those nerves. One of which is don't over prepare. Like if you know your stuff, you know your stuff. Like a teacher is a teacher is a teacher. And, and a good teacher who is worth hiring is could probably do this on 10 minute notice and, and do it pretty well some of the people I graduated with was they were pre prepping for interviews as if it were, gosh, like an ACT or something. And it's like... Becomes pretty robotic. Pretty robotic. Yeah. Pretty robotic. Because, you know, you, you want to make sure that you say it right in the hour that you get, that you mm -hmm. explain to people who you are and what you believe in. And you're right. You know it better than anyone else. So just go mm -hmm. in and be you and um, share what you know. And the other piece with the nervousness, too, 
is that I'll bet you this is applicable to most people going into a new career. You step into that interview room and, and you often mistakenly think that everyone in that room has this job 100% figured out. They've never made a mistake. They're perfect at it. Right? Isn't that what you feel, Jeff? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> but exactly. And so uh, another piece of advice for getting over the nervousness is, is that I wouldn't recommend you doing like the radical honesty thing and walk in there and just be like, guys, I'm nervous. But what I would suggest is that practice sort of uh, self fulfilling empathy, which is understanding that all the people sitting in that room have struggled and that they have also gone through this interview process. And we're probably just as nervous as you. Any school worth working for is going to have people in that interview room who understand how nervous you are. Have grace for that and just be yourself. I, I think that for a first year teacher, it's important to know the academics of it. And it's important to be able to answer some teacher, teacher questions. But it's your personality that's going to give that interview team a l more confidence in you. I can teach a new teacher how to set up their grading schedule, like whatever. But what I can't teach you how to do is is to be confident in your decisions and, and connect with thoughtful. people in the room. Yep. Yeah. That's like a, a mic drop ending. Todd, this is one of the most important parts um, of the podcast. I need okay. you to sit up in your seat. I need you to make sure you're ready. Um, this is called Rapid Fire. You ready are, for these rapid this, fire I'm questions? I'm so excited for this. <laughs> these are doozies. And there's a question. I, I think I remember. <laughs> They're different. Because I, I got a little, for the listeners, I got a little preview of these questions. I don't think all of them. I hope not all of them. All right. You ready for go. these? What is your favorite store-bought cookie? Probably those like cakey cookies with the icing on top at like Kroger and Giant Eagle. Do they have a name? I don't, I don't think those have a name. No. I, I don't know if... You literally chose a cookie that has no name as a nameless cookie? That's what I like about it. It's in the bakery. I know exactly The bakery cookie. About. I think yeah, you just call it a bakery cookie. With like cookie. the frosting on top? Yeah, the just different that, like, that like flat icing on top with the soft cookie. You know the soft cookie. I know. I'm a soft cookie you, guy. Are you? Stop oh, the, the, the thought of trying to eat a sleeve of Chips Ahoy is a nightmare. Like, I don't I mean, wanna, they're good if you dunk them. You can I, dunk don't them dunk. In I don't dunk. Oh. I'm sorry. And I'm not, no offense to anybody who does dunk. I just don't mix my. That's going to be a question, dunker or no dunker. What was the first concert you ever went to? First concert I ever went to was Spice Girls. My dad took me. And if you knew my dad, it's not his natural environment. That had to have been awesome. Yeah, it was crazy. Like, Do you ever talk about it? Do you randomly bring it up and go, hey, dad, remember that one time we went to the Spice you Girls know, I, concert? I don't think I have. I yeah, sometimes I run into your dad in the athletic world, so I'm going to have to ask him about the Spice <laughs> yeah. Girls. And that that was a great first concert. I'm, I'm more, I don't know, proud is, might not be the right word. My, my The second concert I went to was way more up my alley, and that was my mom took me to see um, Kiss and Aerosmith. Oh, at Jermaine Amphitheater when that was still a thing. That was a lot. That was like my first like rock and roll show. The one that really hit me and I was like, I want to do this. What was your first job? <laughs> my first job was uh, being an umpire. What was a totally rad expression you overused in your childhood? That's sick. What was your favorite Halloween costume you wore as a child? Oh, I went Dracula like three years in a row. It's so simple. It's easy. It's fun. What is your favorite movie of all time? I was worried you would ask me this. Today it's... The Breakfast Club. I watched it last night. It's a profound film. I said I'm in the math club, I'm in the Latin club, and I'm in the physics club. First celebrity crush. Going back to Spice Girls, I'm sure that it had something to do with that. They uh, shaped your life, the Spice Girls, didn't they? Yeah, I think so. I think they showed me the importance of teamwork. Mm -hmm. If you lived in Cleveland, would you root for the Browns? Not anymore. Have you ever worn socks with sandals? No. Um, is double dipping a chip or a veggie at a party ever acceptable? Never acceptable. You can do like the break off. That's exactly what I said. Totally Jeff, you That's questioned true. me. You better no, question Todd. Did Biolo I question you? Biologically I think fine. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. Sandwiches don't have connected bread. Go to pizza topping. I, sausage and onion. Well, that's a good one. So this is the lead up to the most important question. Greatest cereal of all time. The greatest cereal of all time is Cinnamon Life. It's the Rolls Royce of cereals. The Lamborghini of cereal. So it's it's everything. That's a very good cereal. Yeah, I know. It's a very good cereal. Todd, thanks for playing along. Absolutely. Wait, what there, was, there, the was one a, there was a question that yeah, you that's asked. What I was going to ask. Man, I never yep. asked it. I, I forget exactly what it is, but it was about candy. Your favorite candy of all time? Yeah. I just want to share my truth with the world on this, okay. which is that Sour Patch Watermelon are the best candy in the world. I just Aww. cannot warm up to anything sour. It's not that sour, Jeff. No, it is, I mean, it is. I would much is. rather have chocolate. Chocolate. You're not a chocolate guy, Todd? Not if there's gummy candies around. But I've actually 
sent handwritten letters to multiple gummy companies about their products. I'm a gummy candy connoisseur because I used to go and buy, oh God, I would probably consume about five bags of Sour Patch Watermelon Kids a week. That's not healthy. And Does it really taste like watermelon? Yeah, sure. Well, it's no. just like fake watermelon, not like real. After you have to the fight through that of watermelon sour. doesn't taste like a real watermelon in my mind. That should be a question. There's no doubt in my mind that the students in Todd's class are entertained. Without a so. doubt, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, that I was appreciate fun. you playing awesome. along, Todd. <laughs> Sure. Thanks for having me on. This is this is a lot of fun. I, I really I'm thankful for the opportunity to talk about teaching. Thanks, Todd. We're pretty lucky to have you in Thanks. Worthington schools. And um, I know our, our students and staff and families feel the same way at Worthington Kilbourne High School. So thanks for being with us today. You're welcome. If you want to hear more, you can find us on our Worthington schools website and on Spotify. A big thanks to Corey Carter and our communications team for making this podcast a reality. And of course, to our students at The Ohio State University in the communications department. The journey may not always be easy, but it'll definitely be worth it. Thanks for taking care of each other and have a great day out there.